Uh, thank you, Harry, for all those kind words. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, exactly 50 years ago last month, on March 8, 1957, four days before he was taken to a federal prison, Wilhelm Reich signed his last will and testament. And by this time, his organ energy accumulators and many of his publications had already been banned and destroyed by the United States government. Starting on June 5, 1956, when three organ energy accumulators were destroyed outside Reich's student laboratory at Organon in Rangeley, Maine. Three weeks later, several boxes of his publications were burned outside the student laboratory at Organon. A month after that, in July, the panels for about 50 organ accumulators were dismantled in the town of Rangeley by the local contractors who built them. And exactly one month after that, on August 23, 1956, several tons of Reich's publications, including the titles of 10 hardcover books, as well as his medical and scientific bulletins and journals, were burned under FDA supervision just three blocks north of here on Gansevoort Street in a municipal department of sanitation and garbage incinerator that was just torn down a few years ago. All of which we can only imagine must have weighed heavily on Reich's mind four days before he would begin what was to be a two-year prison sentence for criminal contempt of court. Now, in the opening paragraph of his last will and testament, he wrote, and I quote, I made the consideration of secure transmission to future generations of a vast empire of scientific accomplishments to guide in my last disposition. To my mind, the foremost task to be fulfilled was to safeguard the truth about my life and work against distortion and slander after my death, end quote. And to accomplish this task, in his will, he created a trust, which was originally known as the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust Fund, so named because of Reich's belief that the only real solution to eliminating psychological disturbances and their subsequent somatic illnesses was in prevention, and that this prevention was possible, possible only by ensuring what he called the unspoiled protoplasm and the unarmored life of infants, who we call children of the future. That's why he called it the Infant Trust Fund. Now, the term itself, Infant Trust Fund, actually appears in one of Reich's publications as early as 1954, when Reich periodically, uh, briefly mentions a visit to his daughter, Eva, who was then practicing medicine on the Maine coast. And during this visit, Reich had stopped in in the nearby town of Bar Harbor, Maine, for advice regarding his will. And writing about this in the July 1954 issue of Cosmic Oregon Engineering, he says, quote, I met a very kind bank official with whom I left my will and some documents regarding the transformation of the Wilhelm Reich Foundation into an infant trust fund. So we see this term as early as 1954. And by the way, Reich was always updating his will. In fact, in the book American Odyssey, which are his uh, letters and journals from 1940 to 47, there are several references to his will from that period of time. And going back even further, to his journals and his diaries from 34 to 39, which are published as Beyond Psychology, Reich is often expressing concern and wonder about how future generations will view his constantly evolving scientific legacy. And so, on March 8, 1957, Reich's concerns and his practical solutions for transmitting his legacy to future generations after his death culminate, culminate in the signing of his last will and testament. Four days later, on March 12th, Reich entered the federal penitentiary in Danbury, Connecticut. Ten days after that, on March 22nd, two days before his 60th birthday, Reich was transferred to the federal penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, to serve his two-year sentence. Seven and a half months later, on November 3rd, 1957, he died in the penitentiary of heart failure and was buried several days after that at Oregon. In his last will and testament, Reich had named his daughter, Dr. Eva Wright, as the sole trustee of the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust Fund. She was the individual now charged with carrying out Reich's final wishes as stipulated in the will. And among the will's principal stipulations was this one, quote, to operate and maintain the property at Organon under the name and style of the Wilhelm Reich Museum, unquote. And in the will, Reich elaborated on this stipulation by enumerating some specific responsibilities. He says, quote, I have collected all of the pertinent materials, such as instruments which serve the discovery of the life energy, the documents which will witness the labors of some 30 years, 
The library of a few thousand volumes collected painstakingly over the same stretch of time and amply used in my researches and writings. All of these things and similar things should remain where they are now to preserve some of the atmosphere in which the discovery of the life energy has taken place over the decades. The ground should be kept neat and clean, and repairs should not be neglected." End quote. Now, well before his imprisonment, Reich had stored his archives in two separate locations in one building, in a photographic darkroom on the first floor of the Oregon Energy Observatory, which is the major building in Oregon and is now the museum. The second location was in a large closet off of Reich's study and, li and library on the second floor of the observatory. And in the will, immediately after his stipulations about the museum, Reich begins his discussion about his archives. And this is what he writes, quote, in order to enable the future student of the primordial cosmic energy ocean, the life energy discovered and developed by me, to obtain a true picture of my accomplishments, mistakes, wrong assumptions, pioneering basic trends, my private life, my childhood, etc., I hereby direct that under no circumstances and under no pretext whatsoever shall, shall any of the documents, manuscripts, or diaries found in my library, among the archives, or anywhere else be altered, omitted, destroyed, added to, or falsified in any other imaginable way. The tendency of man born from fear to get along with his fellow man at any price and to hide unpleasant matters is overpoweringly strong. To guard against this trend, disastrous to historical truth, my study, including the library and archives, shall be sealed right after my death by the proper legal authorities, and no one shall be permitted to look into my papers until my trustee, here and after name, is duly appointed and qualified and takes control and custody thereof. These documents are of crucial importance to the future of newborn generations. I therefore direct my trustee and his successors that nothing whatsoever must be changed in any of the documents and that they should be put away and stored for 50 years to secure their safety from destruction and falsification by anyone interested in the falsification and destruction of historical truth." End quote. <coughs> now what I find always heartbreaking about the will is Reich's implicit hope that his daughter, with the support of his colleagues and students, and fueled with a singular vision and resolve, would work together to carry out his final wishes regarding the transmission of his legacy to future generations. And in that hope, Reich was completely wrong. Regrettably and understandably, Eva Reich was so emotionally devastated by the tragedy of her father's death that months later she let it be known that she could not assume the awesome responsibility of the trusteeship that someone else had to be found to do this. Yet no one among Reich's colleagues and students stepped forward to assume the mantle of the trusteeship and carry out the specifics of Reich's last will and testament. No cohesive group ever assembled after Reich's death to categorically ensure the fulfillment of his final wishes and not anyone else's. That task ultimately fell to a woman barely 34 years old, a former patient, Dr. Chester Rayfields stepped forward to offer her services. That woman was Mary Boyd Higgins, who at the age of 81 and a half is still going strong, and with whom I have the pleasure of working at the Trust in the Museum. And so in the early months of 1959, during the winter, Mary traveled to the rural town of Rangeley, Maine, to visit Wright's 200 and plus acre property at Oregon for the first time. The student laboratory and the Oregon Energy Observatory were abandoned, boarded up, and vandalized unattended and unprotected for nearly two years against the harsh New England elements. Inside the Oregon Energy Observatory, Wilhelm Reich's archives were gone. Removed illegally the previous year by Aurora Carrar, the last woman in Reich's life, who transported the archives hundreds of miles away to the house that she shared with her mother in Bethesda, Maryland. And as I said two years ago in my remarks at the Williams Club on the occasion of Mary Higgins' 80th birthday, what a sad and tragic irony that Wilhelm Reich, truly one of the most original thinkers of the 20th century or any century, should have his legacy and his wishes so disrespected, so diminished, and so pitifully neglected. And to make matters worse, when Reich's last will and testament were finally probated and all specific personal bequests were fulfilled, $823 
was all that was left for Mary Higgins to turn the situation around and to carry out Wright's final wishes. Today, that would translate into approximately $5,700, less than $6,000 to transform Oregon on from the ruin that it was into the beautiful and vibrant property and museum that it is today. Less than $6,000 to retrieve and protect Reich's archives for future generations according to the dictates of his will. Shortly after that first visit to Oregon on, Mary Higgins traveled to Bethesda, Maryland. And during several face-to-face -face meetings, Ms. Carrar repeatedly denied that she had the archival materials. Only when Mary Higgins took legal action against her did Ms. Carrar and her attorney produce suitcase after suitcase after suitcase after suitcase filled with archival materials, which the court subsequently turned over to the trust. But many archival materials were still missing, and the trust's legal efforts to retrieve additional materials from Ms. Carrar would stretch across over four decades. Now is to Reich's final wishes to establish a museum. <clears throat> Lillian Rangeley was a wonderful gentleman, and literally a gentleman, by the name of Tom Ross, who for years had been the caretaker at Oregon when Reich was alive. In fact, for a time, he and his wife, B and their daughter, Catherine, <coughs> actually lived in one of the cabins at Oregon while he was a caretaker. The entire Ross family became close friends with Mary Higgins, and it was with their assistance, their generosity of time, and hard physical work, that in 1960, Mary was able to open Oregon on to the public as the Wilhelm Reich Museum. Today, Oregon on comprises 175 acres of fields, forests, and trails, which are open daily to the public. The Oregon Energy Observatory, which had been abandoned, boarded up, and vandalized, is now listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and is open for tours in the summer and early fall, and by special arrangement throughout the year. The Student Laboratory, which also had been abandoned and vandalized, is now the conference building and also the location of the museum and trust offices. Now jumping back again to 1959, the first year of Mary Higgins' tenure as trustee, a third area of responsibility began to emerge for the trust, in addition to creating a museum and retrieving the archives. And that third responsibility was republishing Reich's books, although publishing was not a specific stipulation in Reich's last will and testament. And the way it happened was this. A scholar and professor named Leo Raditza, who was interested in Reich's work, approached Roger Strauss of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, which at the time was a flourishing 13-year-old New York publishing house. In 1959, there was still considerable interest in Reich's work, but it was difficult or impossible for people to find copies of Reich's books, except maybe in secondhand bookstores, since the 1954 court injunction had banned, had banned the books from being distributed by Wright, and since tons of Wright's books from his Oregon Institute Press, right here in Greenwich Village, had been burned in 1956, three blocks away. Raditz explained to Strauss that perhaps there was an audience for these books, and wondered if Strauss might explore the possibility of bringing them back into print. The result of all of this was a wonderful and productive 45-year professional relationship between Roger Strauss and Mary Higgins as well as a genuine personal friendship, during which time all of Reich's hardcover books were republished and several new titles were brought out. Starting in 1960, with the publication of Wilhelm Reich's Selected Writings, an introduction to organomy. The concept of this book was actually Roger Strauss's, who felt that an anthology of excerpts from Reich's books might be the best way to introduce his work to a broader, more mainstream audience. This was followed by the publication of The Function of the Orgasm in 1961, Sexual Revolution in 1962, Character Analysis, 63, Listen Little Man, 65, The Murder of Christ, 66, and in 1967, an entirely new book entitled Reich Speaks of Freud, which was published against the vehement objections of Kurt Eisler of the Freud Archives. At the time of Mr. Strauss's death in May 2004, at the age of 87, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux had published 21 titles by Wright, including three volumes of his diaries and journals and the correspondence between Wright and A.S. Neal. And because of the publishing house's strong international presence, Wright's books now appear in over 21 languages. What I find so moving about Mr. Strauss's relationship with the trust is this. He was the first to admit 
that he had no great personal interest in Reich, nor any great understanding of Reich's work, and that his decision to publish Reich's work was because of his sense of outrage and his need to take a principled stance against book burning in America. Roger Strauss is truly one of the unsung heroes in transmitting Reich's legacy to future generations, first as a publisher, and secondly as the individual who brought the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust to the attention of the Countley Library of Medicine at Harvard University, one of the world, world's premier medical libraries. For years after Mary Higgins had legally retrieved the bulk of Reich's archives from Aurora Carrar, she kept these materials in her home in Forest Hills, New York, where she lived up until about five years ago. And during this time, she visited several institutions looking for a permanent repository for these materials, including the Library of Congress and several university libraries. Meanwhile, Roger Strauss contacted someone that he knew, a man named Richard Wolfe, the chief librarian of the rare books and special collections at Harvard's Compley Library. Mr. Wolfe felt that Reich's legacy was an important one and that these archives would be a welcome addition to the library's other collections. And so in October 1973, an agreement was signed between the trust and the Compley, whereby Reich's archival materials would be periodically given to the Compley Library over the years to be stored in their rare books and special collections with the trust retaining all copyright title and publishing rights. Today at the Conway Library, Reich's archives are kept in a temperature controlled environment in the rare books and special collections, which was recently renamed and is now known as the Center for the History of Medicine. Reich's archives comprise well over 200 archive boxes of materials. Each archive box measures 15 inches by 12 inches by four inches. These materials include correspondence, microscopic, scientific, and personal films, original manuscripts, both published and unpublished, microscope slides, personal file, files, including diaries and journals, photographs, organizational materials, such as documents from the Oregon Institute Press, the Organomic Infant Research Center, the Wilhelm Reich Foundation, and other entities, work development papers and laboratory protocols, plus William Steig's original drawings from, for Listen and Little Man. And starting in November of this year, 50 years after Wright's death, these archives will be accessible to scholars and researchers. So these have been the major responsibilities and accomplishments of the Wilhelm Wright Infant Trust. Wright's archives, now at Harvard, the publishing of Wright's books in New York, and the museum in Rangeley, where our bookstore carries the largest assortment of Wright's publications available anywhere, including our own reprints of his research bulletins and journals. Today, well over 7,000 pages of Reich's own writings are publicly available. But 50 years after Reich's death, all of these achievements continue to be overshadowed by the chilling effect of a 1954 complaint for injunction declaring that Oregon energy is non-existent, overshadowed by the chilling effect of a 1954 decree of injunction, which ordered the destruction of Oregon energy accumulators and many of Reich's publications, a chilling effect that essentially put an end to Reich's medical and natural scientific research in this country 50 years ago. And the result, 50 years later in 2007, the same slanders and distortions and misrepresentations about Reich's work in books, magazines, and across the internet. In virtually no progress in Reich's medical and natural scientific research here in the United States of America. Here in Reich's adopted country, the home of Oregonon and the Wilhelm Reich Museum, and the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust, Reich is completely dismissed and maligned by the traditional medical and scientific communities. And while we should take great consolation that Oregon therapy survives and thrives and is continually being nourished, as we'll be seeing in today's presentations, equal attention and effort needs to be devoted to Reich's medical and natural scientific legacy regarding practical applications of Oregon energy. I sometimes hear people say it's just a matter of time before the scientific and medical communities recognize Wright's contributions, and that's a statement that I don't accept. I don't believe it's good enough for anyone who professes an interest in Wright's leg legacy to simply say these changes will inevitably happen without trying to develop or at least imagine exactly how and when and by whom these changes might happen which means we need to continually ask ourselves the right questions. For example, where today, if anywhere, 
are the young biologists, chemists, medical students, physicians, and researchers who are reading primary materials by right, such as the Bion experiments on the origins of life, the Bion experiments on the cancer problem, the cancer biopathy, the medical case studies from the Oregon Energy Bulletins, and Wright's contemporaneous journal entries as compiled in Beyond Psychology and American Odyssey. Where today, if anywhere, are the young physicists who are reading the Oregon Experiment, Cosmic Superimposition, the Cosmic Oregon Engineering Bulletins, and Organomic Functionalism. And today, how many young students, therapists, psychoanalysts, and psychiatrists are actually reading Wright's early writings, character analysis, genitality, function of the orgasm, Wright speaks of Freud, how many of them are listening to the hours of available CDs of Wright himself discussing therapeutic issues and techniques with his orgone therapists. So today, 50 years after Wright's death in prison, and over, 50, and over 50 years since his books were banned and burned in this country, if today individuals from these disciplines are ignoring the over 7,000 pages of primary materials that the Trust has made publicly available for decades, then how and when and by whom can we ever expect significant, intellectually honest, practical applications in all areas of rights work to take root in this country? Now, in the past three, year, in the three years, much to my complete horror, I've discovered that my responsibilities at the Trust and Museum involve a huge amount of writing, preceded at times by an inordinate amount of thinking, neither of which are my favorite pastimes, both of which I find quite painful. But whenever I am working, I find myself continually drawing upon my professional experience as a writer, as a filmmaker, and a college teacher in devising specific tools and strategies and language and imagery for reaching out and trying to attract a wider audience to Wright's legacy. An audience where hopefully we might find individuals to join and support and finance our unending efforts to preserve Wright's historic legacy. An audience where hopefully we might find individuals to promote and to engage in more real world applications of Wright's legacy. And in trying to devise new tools and strategies and language and imagery, I find myself continually asking the following question. What are the basic themes and storylines and real world applications of Wright's legacy that might be of interest to a broader audience? beyond the confines of what is essentially a small and loosely defined community of people interested in Wright. The answers for each of us, of course, will vary. But for me personally, I came across a phrase last year that in my own mind helped me to clarify and frame some of the basic themes and storylines of Wright's life and work, and which helps me in my work at the Trust and the Museum. And it's from the famous Matthew Arnold poem, Dover Beach which Arnold wrote in 1851, shortly after he was married. And it seems pretty clear that Arnold is addressing his wife in this poem. And this is what he writes to her. Let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor servitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. And while I don't completely ascribe to Arnold's dismal worldview, in a world where there truly is very little certainty and very little peace, help for pain is precisely what Wright was providing and continually striving for. As a medical student, physician, and young psychoanalyst, help for pain was the basis for all of his work. As a revolutionary social activist, a public speaker, a founder of hygiene clinics for the working classes of Austria and Germany, he provided help for pain on a massive scale. Help for pain was his justification for rejecting Freud's death instinct as an excuse for the failure of psychoanalysis and for going on to develop more effective therapeutic techniques. His laboratory experiments with the bions and the T-bacilli and their effects on the cancer cell. The right blood tests as a diagnostic tool for identifying the cancer process prior to the formation of tumors his experimental medical use of the organ accumulator on terminal cancer patients, exploring the potential effects of organ energy on nuclear radiation sickness in the Oregon experiment, his invention of the cloud buster and the door buster, all of these were practical applications to provide help for pain. And help for pain was certainly 
Reich's guiding principle when he drew up his last will and testament, and when he signed it 50 years ago, last month, on March 8, 1957, and created the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust to transmit his legacy to future generations and to safeguard the truth about his life and work against distortion and slander after his death. Do you have any questions? <laughs>
attended by between 200 to 300 people, standing room only. People could not get in. It was the hot ticket in town. What's often lost, as I'd like to point out, when you talk to people who were around, the remaining people who remember it, is Wright's arrival in New York was reported in the New York Post and in a number of other people, places as a major arrival along the lines of Einstein uh, arriving in, 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 New, in, in the New World as a refugee. He was not seen as some obscure figure. Don't you have to remember this was a man who had been nominated for the Nobel Prize and, and you know had been talked about as a major scientific presence. And Jim Strick, who was not here, as Owen pointed out, and when Wright came to this country, you know, as a refugee, his reputation as a major scientific presence in the world in the international community was believed to be by him and others secure as you know, controversial but nonetheless present. Things that happened, as Kevin has reviewed, in, in the years after that, right, changed his perspective to a more marginalized perspective. And that has a lot to do with the history, of, some of which we will address later this afternoon, the history of what's taking place in modern science or contemporary science uh, worldwide, or certainly in the United States. In Europe, I think, which is important to look at, it's, and, and Latin America and other parts of the world, it's not quite as dismal a, a response, although it's erratic. But we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, we have time for questions? Yeah, no, no, no. If anyone has one. Yeah. Kevin, do you know why he was moved from Danbury to Lewisburg? I mean, that, I, I think it was just a routine thing, really. He was, it was routine processing there. They gave him a psychiatric examination. Silbert stayed there. Um, maybe they didn't want the two of them in the same place. I don't know. But that's where Silbert did his time. We, we, we know that Wright, at that point, was very, very adamant about not having anything to do with it. He had been very, very... Uh, upset about Silver's behavior and so even though he took responsibility for much of what Silver had set in motion, that's another hit chapter of history as to what Silver's role in, 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 in the uh, collapse of much of this was. But that's to be he didn't want to run into Silver in the prison cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any um, thoughts on the Nobel Prize winner Jim Strick? We have some editions in German. Um, uh, some uh, you could order them in like, but we, you know, we don't carry all the languages. We have a few scattered books and a few scattered languages, um, but we don't have every single permutation. That would really be impossible. And when I said Reich's uh, works are represented in twenty-one languages, that doesn't mean every book is in twenty-one languages. Obviously. Uh, uh, Different countries have expressed uh, different interests in different books. So we, we do have a few German ones. I think we have a few Italian and Spanish ones. I'm pretty sure. Italian and um, Spanish are very big. Yeah. They, they, yeah. They're, they're okay. big. So have the original German editions been republished in German speaking uh, All his work, uh, yeah, yeah, most of his books are in German. Yeah, through Forrest Strauss and Drew. Uh, he said, relations of the, like, is there? First edition, first two editions has uh, character analysis were in German. Yeah. The third edition, I don't know, probably just English. Oh, that's an interesting question. What, 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 right. what you're saying is, is the edition that's so the German in Germany the translation, translation of the edition that um, the, the museum has published, yeah. or is it a reproduction of the original German? No, no, it's not a reproduction of the original. I, I don't believe it's a reproduction of the original. Oh, no. I don't think so. Uh, no, and that goes to copyright. Uh, Issues regarding uh, translators who right. used to uh, have a great deal of have old can of worms. <laughs> well, I just have a question about the archives. Um, are, if you find that there are manuscripts that publish a book, are they going to be made public for everyone to read? Or when you say you when say you say you when you say everyone, what do you mean? Like, um, well, you said to go to the muse, to the uh, li library, you have to be. Uh, Scholar and research, people will apply. Someone's not going to be able to just walk in off the street. Okay, but I'm saying if I wanted access to it as a normal person, you know, would I be able to get in there? Or is some of it going to be published? That kind of stuff? Uh, well, it's two questions. Uh, you know, uh, I would apply if I were you. In terms of uh, publishing future things, yes, obviously we would like to publish future things, but the um, 
with the death of Roger Strauss, the entire complexion of Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux has changed. And so we have to really count ourselves fortunate that it went on as long as it did. In some ways, it was sort of a golden age. It's never going to be that way anymore. Uh, we don't get that kind of personal attention that we got from Roger, and we never will. And so what happens in terms of the future publishing, uh, I don't know. We still, we, there are one or two books that we would like to bring along. One of them is the, uh, uh, the sequel to American Odyssey. But we don't have their ear anymore, quite like we did. And that's going to be a challenge and a difficulty uh, in the future. It's a very unfortunate situation. But it just shows you the power of what one individual can do. And just a brief story about Roger Strauss. He told the story at the Williams Club uh, about five years ago when Reditz had first approached him about all this. He didn't know that much about it, right? And he went and talked to a friend of his who was a psychiatrist and said, this guy will come right. He said, what do you think of his work? Is this, is this worth getting involved in? Is this worth publishing? And the guy said, yes, it is. What if the guy had said, no, it isn't? Uh, so it's a real, yes. To, to what extent is the trust fund involved or will maybe in the future be involved in the direct protection of infants? I mean, social political sphere. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, and I didn't read any of the verbiage from the will. Uh, as I said, it was originally called the Wilhelm Reich Infant Trust Fund. And there is a clause in there that says for the protection of, uh, of infants and things like that. We barely get by every year. You know, there is really no money uh, to specifically take care of that kind of thing. The museum itself, with its massive infrastructure alone, costs about 160 yeah. grand to run. No, I don't mean to minimize no, 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 the no. importance of the first step of yeah. preserving rights, uh, legacy, and, and history. We have that. Uh, that would be gravy. That would be gravy in the future. The, 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 the one specific thing in terms of children that we do is he, uh, he did say in his will that his larger cabin, which he originally bequeathed to Peter, um, the, what he calls the lower cabin, he gave to Peter with the provision that if, within a few, that if Peter wasn't using it, after so many years, it would be returned to the trust. And then it would be turned into a summer home for children, is what he said in the will. And eventually, it did come back to the trust. It's called Tamarack now. And, uh, and in the summers, uh, well, I don't know, for about 18 years now, <coughs> Uh, we have an arrangement with a main foster and adoptive care program where, uh, and they do this by lottery at their association where for a week, for eight weeks, a different family comes and gets to use the cabin and there's, uh, it's not, you know, there's a waterfront there and a dock and everything like that. And these are families that could never afford a vacation like this before and it's all foster care and adoptive care. So, uh, um, but what you're talking about I think would just involve a massive effort and a massive amount of money, and, uh, and, and you know, and maybe that will happen sometime. Uh, the first sort of the basics, just kind of yearly things have to be taken care of, but it's a good point. You hate to just completely ignore that, you know, infant trust. It's infant trust, children of the future. But in order to protect the rights of infants, you have to first educate people about rights. Where right. So, I mean, I think what you're looking for. Well, yes, it's consistent. Exactly. Right. I mean, it's the only way to do it. <clears throat> right. Or, I mean, how else would you afford that? Yeah. And you should also sit, spread the word around that if there's anyone who has a large estate <laughs> and, and wants to endow the trust, you know, that, that, I'm sure they would make arrangements to uh, We consider taking it. <laughs> well, they have, been, yeah, they have been political people involved, but usually they, they try to stay low profile because they, they, it becomes, there have been some notorious stories of people the politics who wound up being in for them treatment they've gotten into uh, hot water when it was found out that they had been so. Senator Peter Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I have, I'll, I'll put them on a table somewhere, and I, I don't know if I have enough for everyone. I have, uh, it's an organizational chart which basically delineates the three major, three major functions. Uh, uh, but you can, uh, I, I actually, and, and if there's not enough copies, yeah, the copy of the lunch, I think I have some more copies in my office nearby. Um, I'll bring this out. I'm, I'm, I don't want to hold up thing. Any other? I just want to say one thing. thing. I want to add to, to what you said about the cabins being being done in the summertime. Is that the the, um, the trust gives those cabins up to those foster uh, families at, at no charge, 
when normally those cabins are available throughout the year for rental. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what a weekly rental is, but if today's rates you would say eight hundred to a thousand dollars a week, so it does it does mean that they that they contribute somewhere of seven to eight thousand dollars a year, which considering the fact that there is so little money to run this operation, that's money that they could have been making otherwise, and that's part that's it's, it's really like the maximum amount that they could possibly extend. They give up that income in order to give those families something. To, to sort of keep the children in the future identified. Um, we also uh, send out monthly or bi-monthly an update. If anyone uh, doesn't receive those, you give me your email address, I'll just add you to the list. Why don't we set up, we'll set up uh, at the break uh, an email list, uh, and, uh, and, and I guess it's still so old-fashioned, you can even need phone numbers or addresses, but it seems email lists seem to be the... Uh, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.